All right. Well, good afternoon. I hope everybody had a good lunch and uh, we're all energized and ready for our afternoon presentation um, or presentations, plural, I should say. A um, couple of notes really quickly. Uh, by the way, for those of, us, those of you joining us online, uh, my name is John Nimmers and I am the curator of the Panama Canal Museum Collection. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we've been having a two-day event with multiple uh, speakers. We've had a wonderful film screening this morning of, of the Diggers documentary by Roman Foster, which was very well received. And so now we're nearing the end of our two-day uh, wonderful uh, series of sessions. Um, before that, I just wanted to say a couple things uh, up front. I neglected this morning. For those of you in the room, I did this yesterday, but I forgot to do it today. I want to acknowledge again our generous support from the Center for Latin American Studies, our other co-sponsor, along with the libraries and Pan Caribbean Sankofa on this event. Uh, we rely on them greatly for, uh, for their support. Uh, and we have a very close working relationship with their faculty and students. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, for those of you uh, joining us online, if you haven't participated in all of the events online, if you've missed a session, um, we've been recording everything. Uh, we even recorded our uh, Q&A and introduction sessions uh, this morning with uh, Mr. Foster when uh, we were having our screening of, the, of his film. And all of our content will be put online and we'll be sending out links to everybody after the fact so you can go back and you can see things you missed or rewatch things that you, you actually participated in, but you just wanna go back and enjoy them again. Um, all right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce you now to uh, associate curator, Betsy Bemis, and let me do one little thing on the computer here. All right, oh, give you an advanced view of the slide. All right, uh, Betsy Bemis is our associate curator for the Panama Canal Museum Collection. Uh, she's running away from the podium right now. I think she's abandoned us. <laughs> Take it away, Betsy. Oh, we're not sharing that. Thank you. I think we're looking at the wrong view. I appreciate that. Try that again. I just hit, I forgot to share. <laughs> That's the important part. That working? Okay, I think we're set now. All right. Thank you, John. Hi, so again, my name is Betsy Bemis and I'm the associate curator. So I'm John's colleague. I know he's been kind of your tour guide for the past few days. Um, before we get started, I did wanna go ahead and say a few personal things and please forgive me. I'm not very good at giving talks like this, like, in, like the trained academic I am, I have to write things down so I don't forget what I want or I need to say. So I forgive me for reading. Uh, as I was preparing my presentation, preparing what I wanted to say, I thought about the type of relationship that I have with Pan Caribbean Sankofa and it is a deeply personal relationship. Uh, I talk to them almost every day it has been the highlight of my professional career at the libraries. The highlight of my life is probably the day I returned the last library book after finishing my PhD, but that's a different era. So as my career with the libraries, my highlight has been Sankofa. Uh, the history piques my research curiosity. It makes me smile, it moves me, it breaks my heart, it makes my soul soar. Chasma steers or course with her thoughtful insight. And I'm always impressed by her. Carmen is a woman after my own heart. She's in the weeds with me in the details, um, but she does it with a much more beautiful and calm demeanor than I do. I can kind of, the stress gets to me and she's always uh, lovely and gracious. Um, I was telling a colleague yesterday that during COVID and one of my low points, which I know many of us had, uh, Carmen must have sensed it, which I think she's got that, that insight. And then she invited me to do an aerobic session that she was leading on Zoom. So I signed on and it, in, it shifted even if it was just for a short time where I was in my mind and that's who Carmen is. And Fran, whose capabilities and enthusiasm are infinite and often come in the form of a text message at 2 a.m. <laughs> but I love it and it's what sustains us. 
So to them, I just want to say thank you. And to the rest of you, I want to say I'm sorry for the somewhat unorthodox presentation that came out of my kind of typical excessive emotion and excessive overthinking of things. So with that ringing endorsement, I'll go ahead and get started with the official presentation. Where do you see Melissa? Oh, no. Yeah, it wouldn't. Oh, there we go. Ah, perfect. Thank you, John. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our oral history program and our exhibits. And rather than discuss them separately, I'm going to talk about them together because they so often influence and impact each other. So again, I'm going to talk about the oral history program that we have um, from A.R. Lewis Sankofa and then our exhibits. So the Panama Canal Museum collection at the University of Florida has been creating exhibits since the collection arrived here in 2012. And you can see in the few examples that I selected to show you here that those exhibits include things like student online exhibits, which you see in the top right. Um, but the majority of them have been in the Navid Panama Canal Gallery, which is here in the library building. And if you haven't had an opportunity, many of you have probably passed it going to the restroom, but take, uh, you know, that's our main gallery and take a moment and go through it if you'd like. And we're able to, to um, put on these exhibits with the support of our incredible libraries exhibits team. Lourdes and Katiana, and so thank you to them. They're not with us today, but um, they certainly are uh, an important part of that. And a thank you to Liz Bouton, who is no longer with us, but she has worked with us with Sankofa in the past, and she played an important role in the success of a lot of these exhibits. The gallery itself opened in 2017, and since then we've explored topics like food in the canal zone, and you can see that with the photo of the commissary, the inside of a commissary. World War II in Panama and the canal zone. And you can see the, some spotlights over the canal zone there on the top left. Um, some of the significant moments of exchange or upheaval that happened between the, Panama, the United States and Panama during the 20th century. And that would be the middle there, the American Canal in Panama. And finally here at the bottom left corner, you have our current exhibit. The exhibit on display in the gallery right now is about healthcare and sanitation at the Panama Canal throughout the 20th century. And those guests with us in person have had the opportunity to walk through, but for those of you on Zoom, we can put a link in the chat so you can visit the digital version of this exhibit. It touches on the harsh conditions and disease of the construction era, highlights some unique features of health at an international crossroads, and spotlights some important elements of the community's efforts. The problems of malaria and yellow fever are included, as well as the evolving medical infrastructure that encompasses Borges Hospital, dispensaries, localized clinics, many of the things that you are familiar with. Both John and Caroline Liefers mentioned yesterday that she contributed photographs and her expertise to the case that discusses the dangers and lasting impacts of construction era accidents reproductions of a page from the record of injuries that she showed us and one of the letters that she shared are included in this case so you can take a closer look at those if that interested you. There are subjects that exemplify the unique situation at the canal like quarantine and increased disease awareness and vaccination and there are others that draw attention to the more common issues that the canal zone shared with many other places in the world. It touches on the roles of Americans, Panamanians, Caribbean people, indigenous people, women, men, employees, volunteers, scientists, social clubs, those in good health and those plagued by chronic conditions. It tells the broadest story possible, acknowledging and including the experiences of as many different groups as we were able to represent. And I just wanted to show you a larger image of this. This kind of powerful image comes from a magazine cover from 1904, and you can basically see this personification of death sitting on top of the canal construction. And the title of this piece is Waiting. So, you know, very much presence of mind that 
that death were, was waiting for many of the people that were living in this, living and working in this environment. Our exhibits are up for a year. They are installed in the spring, so you have about five months to come and see it. Our next exhibit will be about the engineering of the canal, and we've been researching and designing that over the past year. But it's not too late. If you have an amazing treasure you wanna share with us that you feel like would enhance the exhibit, please reach out, let us know, and, and you know, maybe that can be a part of the exhibit next year. When we pick our exhibit topics, the stories that we're able to tell and the subjects that we're able to address are largely determined by what we actually have in the collection. If we don't have materials, documents, artifacts, photographs about the Panama Railroad, for example, we can't tell that story very well or arguably at all. So additionally, if we only have objects related to the official running of the railroad and we don't have any information written about or by the people that worked on the railroad or the people that rode the railroad, we're not able to tell the full story or paint a holistic picture. This is a problem that we are really aware of and actively try to address by collecting a wide variety of things that represent diverse life experiences and communities. And John talked to us about this yesterday and helping us paint a more holistic picture is one of the ways that the collection has been the most immediately impacted by our relationship with Pan-Caribbean Sankofa and the oral history interviews that they've done. So that's what I wanna focus on with you today. And it has happened in a few different ways. So firstly, we've been able to document new information. And if we know more about an object, we can better understand all the different stories that it can tell and the voices that it speaks to. One example of this came from an interview that Sankofa did with Miss Gloria Holness earlier this year on her 90th birthday. And I actually think these are a little bit out of order because I wanted to show you Gloria first. Um, her children and her grandchildren joined the Zoom interview so that they could all hear her memories and stories and celebrate her life. It was really wonderful to see and be a part of, even though I'm, I am entirely behind the scenes, I get the privilege of seeing these incredible moments. Um, we had a million forms to sign and logistics to talk through with all of these people. But when you see the screen and the faces from all the different generations, it's really amazing. And, it, and it's certainly worth all of that extra effort. So right after this, and we'll jump back here, Fran texted me this photo. And I was familiar with this moment from a series of official photographs taken by the Panama Canal Company that we have in the collection. And the photos were taken during the visit of the then Vice Presidential First Lady, Pat Nixon, to the Canal Zone in 1955. And for those of you that were here in person yesterday for the viewing of archival objects, there were a number of photographs from this same set that were out on the tables you might've seen. In the group of photos, Pat Nixon's name and the date that, are, that the photo was taken are documented, but few other people are identified. But in her interview, Gloria Holness told us that she is the teacher in this photo. So because of that interview, this new information will be added to our database and the photograph will now be properly associated with Ms. Holness. So someone could type her name into our database and find her. This would come up as, a, as an image that she was a part of. Having the names of individuals makes viewing a photograph and the exhibit that that photograph might be a part of a more personal experience. It allows us to discover and share new layers of connection and meaning in multiple objects. Because we now know the name of the teacher, we can search our digital database, the collection, as I said, and find other newspaper articles, yearbooks, or photographs that include her. Another way that our exhibits have been impacted by our partnership with Pan-Caribbean Sankofa is that we have been able to include the voices of Caribbean people by using quotes from oral history interviews and exhibits. This year's exhibit was the first time that we've really been able to do this after partnering with them because the 2020 exhibit was left up for two years 
due to campus closures and COVID. So one of our exhibits was left up for twice the amount of time because no one was here to see it. So this was the, really the first time we were able to utilize these incredible interviews that Sankofa had done. One, uh, I'm gonna share a few examples with you, two examples. One is Miss Nellie Ibarra. She did an interview with Pan Caribbean Sankofa and donated some additional materials related to her life. From her interview, we knew that she had incredible stories to tell about her experiences working in the healthcare field. And she introduced us to her work with the retirees and the program started in 1960 to deal with their declining health. Because of her interview, I looked into this program in greater detail and ultimately decided to include it in the exhibit. So if you've taken a walk down, you might be familiar with this in the exhibit. As you can imagine, there are a lot of subjects or details or stories that could be included in any given exhibit, no matter what it is about. All of them can be amazingly interesting, but you only have so many display cases and so much room in each case. And I admittedly get carried away in the research phase. That's what I love. But from that first draft I created to the one that was installed, I think I had to cut about a third of the text and at least four topics completely. So four things that I had found that deserved attention and were really incredible, but that there just isn't space for. And for those of you that have walked through the gallery, you know that I crammed about as much stuff as humanly possible in there. And the exhibit staff used a lot of creative thinking to help me keep as much of that text I wrote as possible. But space is unfortunately finite. This is very, this very important subject made the cut when many others didn't in no small part because of Mrs. Ibarra's interview. Her interview allowed us to share this story through her words and it allowed us to get a personal connection with her. I ultimately selected this photograph that I found after searching for her in the database, and it's from the monthly publication that many of you could be familiar with, the, the Panama Canal Review. The same thing or very familiar or very similar thing happened with Eleanor Millet. She did an interview with Sankofa while we were in the research phase of exhibit planning. And when I looked through the database after hearing her story about polio vaccination distribution in the canal zone, I found a related article and a group photo that included Eleanor. So you can see her uh, pictured here. And it's unlikely that this subject would have been chosen except for the fact that because of the interview with Eleanor could tell us her own experience in her own words and that it was further enriched by this connection to the article in the photograph. And this is also from the Panama Canal Review. So, and in case it is not obvious, I use this resource a lot, uh, possibly every day, every other day for sure. And our set is completely digitized and searchable. So it's in our digital, digital database. It's a really wonderful resource that gives you a glimpse into the community and everyday lives of the people that lived and worked there. For those of you that are not familiar, you can, you know, what's going on in the canal zone and in Panama in October, 1952, and you can go find that. It's again, it's all searchable. You can type in names, they have retirement dates, they have, it's uh, someone's 20 year anniversary working on the canal. So you certainly could find friends and loved ones in their names, possibly photographs. I think Bernadette, I think we found your a Christmas photo of your family in there, I believe. Yeah, so it's really wonderful. I use it all the time and it's here for you um, to look through. Uh, many of you have probably heard me talk about our, our oral history project and some of our other programs, so I'll keep it brief, but I did want to make sure everyone was familiar with the project page on our website, and we'll drop the website and, and these links into the chat for the attendees on Zoom. So this is the project page that we share with Sankofa that you can read and learn about, um, and you can access this through our main collection. Um, we have a, an interview page that this is a, a place you can come and click through uh, on any of the interviews that you're interested in seeing. And I just wanted to share with you a slide of everyone that has participated in interviews to date. So a really wonderful group of people and a lot of people have given their time and energy to this, which we're kind of extraordinarily grateful for. 
One of the wonderful things that has come out of the project in relationship with Pan-Caribbean Sankofa is that we have been able to acquire new objects which expand the stories our exhibits can tell. Many of the interview participants have graciously shared photographs, documents, and personal writings, and some of them have shared incredible things with us independently of an interview. And that brings me to the last example I have of how quickly this partnership has been able to profoundly impact what we can do. And it's where I want to start introducing the gift that is the foundation of our final presentation today. It was a gift by Deborah Mitchell, who is the daughter of Enid Hall, uh, of some of her mother's documentation about her time in Panama and the Canal Zone. It is also where the name of this event, Memory Lane, is taken from. And if you'll indulge me a little bit, I'll share some of the backstory of how this came about. So Fran Williams Yearwood, one of the directors of Sankofa and I communicate a lot a lot, a lot. And I am sure that many of you that know Fran are not surprised by that. Uh, and when I started to go back through my text messages and my WhatsApp and my work my email and my personal email and my Dropbox to remind myself of how just exactly this happened, it took me a while to find those early exchanges because I was scrolling for a long time. And sadly, the first conversation that Fran and I had about this was over the phone. So you're spared the kind of like excessive joy and us talking over each other and excitement about what an amazing thing this is. Um, but you can see here from the text messages, particularly the one on the right, that since the very beginning, John and I have been wanting to do something special with Deborah's gift. And this text exchange was on April 13th, 2021. So we've been thinking and dreaming about this for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it actually started a few weeks earlier when Fran was speaking to Mr. Mel Belgrave on the phone about doing an interview. And he shared with Fran that he had a photocopy of some notebooks that had belonged to Enid Hall, one of his classmates in Laboka. And Fran knows Enid's family well. And so she reached out herself to Enid's daughter, Deborah, to learn more. Deborah ultimately decided that she wanted to donate the original notebooks and some additional paperwork, some employment information and photographs to the collection here at UF. Fran introduced us via email and Deborah and I got to work on making it official. And Deborah mailed her mother's treasures. We had kind of these few weeks of anticipation waiting for them to make their way through the mail. And this, of course, all of this is in COVID. And waiting to make its way through the university mail system, which is even more slow. Um, but when they did arrive, our planning really started in earnest. When we could finally see what we had, the planning really, really started to move forward. And this isn't necessarily associated with Enid, but it falls within the context of the project. And it struck me because I came across it when I was preparing for this presentation and it is today's date. And I thought, oh, it's not, it's not Enid, it's not related to what I'm talking about, but it felt very fortuitous. So I felt like I had to include it here since it was today's date. Uh, somebody with a better math brain can tell me how many years ago. Um, but to reiterate, from the moment that Fran told me that these items existed, John and I were trying to figure out what our options were on how best to showcase and utilize this incredible material. The partnership with Pan Kirby and Sankofa brought something completely new to us that allowed us to explore and to create, and ultimately it became an exhibit unto itself. During this process, Sankofa has gone back and interviewed Enid's daughter, Deborah, and Enid's sister, Elaine. These interviews captured irreplaceable life stories and deeply informed the project that we're working on. Enid's family was enriching the legacy that she had left behind by joining their voices alongside hers to document their families and their community's history. So to close my curator talk, my portion of this, um, and move on to our last presentation, I just wanna to say to properly preserve this history in the archive, to share with scholars, teachers, and students, and to create the exhibits that we want to create and that are better able to tell a more complete history of the Panama Canal, we need the materials that will help us do that. This is an example of something 
uh, that does. Our goal is to let the community's voices speak for themselves through oral histories and any documents and photographs, personal writings, printed material that you have from the community that to the greatest extent possible was created by the community itself. The online exhibit that Christine is gonna share a sneak preview of is an homage to the effort that Enid made to document her town of Laboka. Is Christine on? Okay, good. All right, Christine Reynolds, who you're gonna see, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce her. She's the presenter of this project, started working for the George Smathers Libraries in her first semester of college in the fall of 2018 as a student assistant in the Special and Area Studies Collections Department, SUS, and continued working as a student assistant in special collections throughout her four years of undergraduate study. So she was with us in the library system for all four years. Christine began working for me and John in the fall of 2021 on a special project for the Panama Canal Museum collection. Recently, Christine graduated from UF with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Graphic Design and completed a three month long fellowship in the Library Technology Services Department of our main library. She's been wonderful to work with and we appreciate her patience with our possibly overbearing interest in what she has brought to life. Before I go, I wanna thank the members of Enid's family who have traveled to be here today and her joining us via Zoom. She's represented by three generations of family, which is quite moving. So Deborah Mitchell, Elaine Hall, Lewis Pearson and his family, Marcia Pearson, Jordan Pearson Exel, Yvonne Exel, Taylor Exel and Camille Exel, uh, Vallis Arlene and Joni Arlene. Forgive me if I missed anyone or mispronounced. Um, we hope that you enjoy this presentation. Yeah, yeah. made it. <laughs> we hope you enjoy it and that we hope we, that we did her justice. And I'll turn it over to Christine. All right, uh, Christine, if you are, if you can unmute and share your screen, I think you should be set. Yes, hello. Hi, Christine. Um, I can't turn my camera on. There's a notification telling me I can't. Oh. I can fix that. I think I did the same thing yesterday. I apologize. Well, that's me. Uh, but in the meantime, is my audio okay? Yes, you sound good. Okay, wonderful. All right, see if you can turn your video on now. Okay, yes, there I am. Perfect. Okay, we can see you. Take it away. Um, Yes, so hello everyone. Um, thank you so much, Betsy, for that wonderful intro uh, introduction and talk. Uh, I am Christine Reynolds and I'm gonna be conducting this last presentation now. Um, and most of it is going to be on my computer screen, but I'll have my camera on just so I'm in the corner. So let me go ahead and get my screen turned on. Are we seeing Silver Laboka? We are, yes. Okay, awesome. So yes, so I'm Christine Reynolds and over the past year, I have been working as an assistant with John and Betsy for the Enid Hall Papers Laboka project. I would also like to give my thanks to John and Betsy real quick for offering me this opportunity to give this presentation. I am very excited to speak about this topic and be able to share this with you all today. So what, what is this? What am I showing? This is an online digital exhibit that documents the history of old Laboka. The exhibit also features a digital interactive map of Laboka that lets visitors explore the old layout of the town with photos and census data. During this presentation, I am going to show a sneak peek of the exhibit and the map. This project is still currently a work in progress, so the website is not yet published, but it is expected to be finished within the next few months. Once it is finished, the exhibit will be accessible on any device with an internet connection. Uh, this exhibit was built using the same uh, story map software that was shown yesterday during the Milton Garvey presentation. So when it's done, you'll be able to access it like you would any other website. 
Now I am going to briefly explain how I became involved in this project. Uh, I was initially hired by John Nemers as a student assistant in the fall of 2021 to help begin digitizing our documents relating to Laboka and Enid Hall. This was a slow process and it took well over four months to get everything scanned and organize our data in spreadsheets. My first assignment was to scan the pages of Enid's notebooks, then organize all her data in Excel spreadsheets. This gave us searchable digital documents that served as the foundation of the project. After I was finished with the notebooks, I scanned a variety of other documents and photos that will eventually be publicly available in a future collection. Whenever I finished one task, it seemed like John and Betsy would always find a new folder or book for me to work on, so the digitization took some time. But of course, all of this work was worth it because now these documents and photos can be saved forever. So after spending so much time working with the material, John offered to let me take the lead on researching and designing the exhibit, and I accepted. Before I began working on this project, I actually didn't know much about the history of the Panama Canal Zone. I had a vague idea about what it was and why it was built, but didn't know anything about the time frame of its existence or the politics that were involved. I read the book, The Canal Builders Making America's Empire at the Panama Canal by Julie Green to learn more about the Panama Canal's history. This book ended up being an important source in my research and I referenced it frequently when writing for this exhibit. Uh, after reading through Enid's notebooks and looking through all of our photos, I became really interested in the lives of the Zonians and learning more about life and culture in the canal zone. My research into Laboka gave me such great insight into what life was like in the small town. With our primary source documents from the Panama Canal Museum collection and my secondary sources like the book from Julie Green, I ended up learning so much about the Panama Canal Zone and its history. And after all this research and time spent working with the materials, I felt extremely motivated to move forward with the project and help with this exhibit. Uh, I graduated from the University of Florida this past May with my degree in graphic design, uh, but I've become so attached to the project that I've continued my work for John and Betsy since then. With my background in graphic design, I have experience in building websites and creating accessible websites. It was important to me that this project um, and the exhibit is easy to use while also being visually appealing. After learning about the story of Laboka, I felt it was very important to help preserve its history. And I feel very honored to be given this opportunity to do so and to be able to use my specific skill set in a way that benefits the town and its people. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the town of Laboka. So. Laboka was a thriving, tight-knit community that was unfortunately disbanded at the end of the 1950s due to the quarters relocation program that was enacted by the Canal Zone government. This program aimed to demolish silver roll towns like Laboka and use the land to build housing for gold roll employees. The gold and silver rolls were payroll classifications for employees working within the Canal Zone. All employees were sorted onto one of the two roles. The gold role was made up of mostly white United States citizens. The silver role was everyone else, with a majority of these employees being of Caribbean descent. Even though Old Laboka was demolished, we were thankfully left with ample documentation of what the town looked like and who lived there. And much of this documentation was made by Enid Hall. Enid used two notebooks to create a handwritten catalog of everything she could remember about Laboka. This included what families lived in what buildings, lists of employees and where they worked, lists of teachers and alumni of the Laboka schools, family trees, and even a long list of nicknames of the people who lived in the town.
These two notebooks are included in the digital exhibit and viewers are able to flip through and zoom in on the pages as if they were actually looking at them in person. And I'm gonna take a moment here to show off uh, how this works and what it looks like. So we have the notebooks embedded into the web page like this, and you can flip through it using these arrows. And this is all made up of images of the notebook that I scanned. For a clearer view, I can put it into full screen, to make it bigger. And using this little bar down here, I can zoom in on the pages. And you can zoom in pretty far. So you can get a really good view of Enid's wonderful handwriting and all of her little notes and everything she wrote down. And I'm moving around the page right now by just clicking and dragging on the image. And to go back, I'll just click that full screen again. So you can see it's uh, pretty interactive the way this is set up. Um, all of Enid's notebooks are included on the exhibit. It's split into three different sections um, just because of the way the technology works, but there are only two physical notebooks. And you can see here are the nicknames. <laughs> So yeah, those are the notebooks, probably our most important source uh, for this exhibit. Enid's notebooks were also crucial sources in creating the digital map of Laboka, which I'm gonna show next. So when creating this map, I used Enid's notebooks to recreate Laboka exactly as it existed in her memory. All of our work and research over this past year has culminated in the creation of this map. When John and Betsy first approached me about taking the lead on this exhibit, none of us were really quite sure if it was even possible to bring this vision to life. But if there's one thing I've learned in college, it's how to overcome a challenge. Uh, their idea was to have a digital map on a web page where you could click on the buildings of Laboka to see more information about them and move around the map to see photos of the town. So to create this map, I used an image of a 1952 map of Laboka as my base and added data to it using software called ArcGIS Pro that is provided to us through the UF Geo Plan Center. Uh, each of these red boxes you see on the map represents a building. And when you click on one, a pop-up appears with more information about that building. I had to spend a good chunk of time on this project just learning how to use the software and then even more time to input all of the data about the town but I'm so glad I did because I was able to bring John and Betsy's vision to life and provide you, the audience, with an interactive recreation of old Laboka. So even though the physical town is no longer around, you can still experience a bit of what it was like to live in Laboka through this map. So now I'm gonna go through the map and show you how it works. Like I said before, I wanted to recreate Laboka exactly as Enid Hall remembered it. So I used her notebooks as reference uh, when inputting information about the buildings. For example, if I click on building 914 here, uh, from her notebook, I know that building 914 was the Catholic Church 
and even had a caretaker named Blanchard. I'd also like to move down here and highlight the Laboca Occupational High School. Thanks to Enid, we have a long list of alumni who graduated from this school, as well as a list of the teachers who worked here. We had lots of photos of the school in our collection, which I included on the map. And to see a clearer view of the photo, you just click on it and it opens up in a new tab and you can zoom in. So you can see here, this is an exterior shot of the building. So in the collection was also included uh, photos of the many workshops that the school operated, such as the metalworking shop. And I'd also like to come down and show the bookbinding shop. The bookbinding shop was especially important because this is where the school yearbooks were printed and bound for many years. Next, I'm going to move up just a little bit and click here on building 1004. This is the building that Enid grew up in with her parents and siblings. We even have census data from the 1940 census that lists them as living in this building. So this is what the census looks like. And if I zoom in here, and find it, there they are. You can see here the Hall family is listed. And of course, from Enid's notebooks, we have the names of the other families who lived in this building with them. And the census pages are attached to every building on the map. Now I'm gonna zoom out, get a wider view of the map. And you may notice these yellow camera icons that are sprinkled all around. Like the red squares on the buildings, you can click on these. And each of these icons represents a photo in that location of La Boca. So if I click on this one in the water, I can open up the photo and see a view of La Boca from the canal, which is pretty cool because you get this really wide landscape shot of the entire town and you can see all the buildings. And the photo is a little scratched up, but you can still zoom in and really see a good view of the town. I'd also like to zoom back in and show this photo. This is located at the intersection of St. Thomas Street and San Domingo Street. So I can click on it and see what that intersection looked like. I tried to include as many photos as possible when creating this map, so viewers would have a true historical visual of the town.
you can see here that we even had photos from inside of the commissary in our collection. Now, if I move over here and click on building 906, you can see some photos of the residents who once lived there. When looking for these photos, I cross-referenced the family names in Enid's notebooks with the 1940 census to find full names for the people who lived there. I then looked for these names in the La Boca school yearbooks to find their photos. And these are the census pages. This process has allowed me to truly bring life to the map. These buildings are not just shapes on a page, but homes where people once lived. And once the map is completely finished and published, I hope it can bring great memories to the residents of La Boca and their descendants. Now that's about it for the map. Um, and now I'm just gonna talk about the exhibit as a whole. So the exhibit itself is split into seven major sections. Introduction, Exploring the Map, Enid Hall, Enid's Notebooks, More Information about Laboca, Notable Labocans, and Conclusion. You can easily uh, move through the sections by clicking on these headers here at the top. Or you can just scroll down and move through it naturally. Now, at the end of the more on Laboca section here, I included a slideshow of photos of Laboca. These are not all of the photos on the map. This is more like a highlight reel of the photos I took from the map, uh, just in case if someone didn't wanna spend so much time exploring every single you know, building and image on the map, they can flip through this slideshow to still get a pretty good idea of what the town looked like. Now, if I scroll down a little more, we get to the Notable Lavokin section. So for the Notable Lavokin section, I chose to highlight three individuals who I came across often in my research. Laboka was a town with a strong educational system and many talented athletes. One of these athletes was Miss Nola Thorne. She participated in the 1938 Central America and Caribbean Olympic Games. Next was Miss Emily Butcher. After earning her bachelor's and master's degrees in the United States from Columbia University, Miss Butcher returned to Laboca to teach music. She then became the first non-U.S. citizen to be a supervisor in the Canal Zone school system. She worked as the school's supervisor of music until her retirement. Finally is Mr. Aston Parchment. Mr. Parchment was a wonderful educator and activist who worked as the school's physical director for many years. He helped coach many of Laboca's athletes, including Miss Nola Thorne. 
Mr. Parchment also assisted students to apply and gain entrance in colleges in both Panama and the United States. I think this picture here is uh, particularly special because it shows Mr. Parchment with, uh, with Ms. Emily Butcher on the same page. Uh, they were both faculty at the junior college. And that's about it for my sneak peek of this exhibit. None of this would have been possible without the generous donations given to us by Enid Hall's daughter, Mrs. Deborah Mitchell. She is the one who donated to us Enid's notebooks, as well as many other documents and photos. I would also like to extend a special thanks to Mrs. Deborah Mitchell and Ms. Vivian Elaine Hall for their participation in recording oral histories with pan Caribbean Sankofa. These oral history interviews were vital resources in the research of Laboka. Thank you all for listening and I can't wait for the future publication of this event. Also feel free to let me know if there's anything you want me to go back to and show again. Uh, we also have some time if anyone has any comments or questions. Thank you, Christine, great job. Uh, once again, for those of you here uh, in, in the uh, room, I have a microphone. If you raise your hand, I'll bring it around. You can ask questions, give comments. And for those of you who are online, you can use the Q&A uh, button to submit a question online and we're monitoring that as well. Yes, have right here. I want all of you to know that I live part of this story. I am originally from La Boca. I was uh, brought to La Boca in 1939. Uh, I was three years of age and I lived there until 19, June of 1953 when I left and came into the service from La Boca. My homes, I had, I lived two places. The first one is in what we used to call commissary street. When you came up the commissary, I was the first family quarters from the bachelor quarters. And I had seven steps. And I will tell you why I said seven steps that I climbed to get to my door. But I lived there until 1953. Then I moved a little ways over from there, two streets over, to building 1016, and I lived there. The other thing I wanna say, it went by pretty fast, but they showed a band, the school band, and I am a member of that band. Uh, Mr. Prescott used to be the uh, professor. I, I, played, I played clarinet in the band, and because of that band, I was able to join the Bombero Band. I paraded with them both in Cologne or wherever they did. The Concordia Band. I even, before I was of age, I played with the American Army Band in uh, the park on Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays. I played with them. I also played with the police band and the community band, Concordia Band uh, in Panama. I left Panama because I was drafted during the Korean War in 1953 and I left on the 9th of June and was brought here to the United States for training for Korea. But I can tell you a whole lot about La Boca because as I said, that's where I was. I ran track there, played baseball, and I did just about everything. And so if anyone wants to know about La Boca, come see me. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And I'll, I'll just add that uh, we're working to get an interview. And so we'll be able to supplement. And as a matter of fact, the, 
the one modification I'd make to the end of Christine's presentation, which was excellent, is I don't know if this project will ever be finished, because I think every time we talk to somebody, we're going to find out something new we can put into this. Um, two quick things, uh, and then I'll go around the room for more questions. But uh, Christine, if you can, um, two, we've had two requests. If you can show that photo of the band again and zoom in on it, if you can find it. And then the other one was, if you can go back to the notebook that, uh, notebook three that had the, I mean, notebook two that had the nicknames and zoom in on the nickname page for everybody. Yes, yes, of course. Give me just a moment. I'm gonna look for the band photo first. Here it is. <laughs> For those of you online, he was pointing out exactly which person he is in the band. I think that's pretty great. <laughs> Stand up again. We, we want to get a photograph. We want to get a photograph. <laughs> They're going to take a photo, Christine, of him standing in front of the photo. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much for sharing it. And Christine, if you want to go on to the uh, nickname book, and then we're going to have another question or comment for you while you're pulling that up. Okay, I think there are a couple other requests of other buildings as well. But let me get to the nicknames first. Christine, I just want you to know that Emily Butcher is still alive and she's 106 years old. She's still alive. She lives I in know. Panama. Okay. I watched her interview. It was so amazing. On listening to her speak about the town in her life, it was it was truly um, such a wonderful experience. And I'm so thankful to Pan Caribbean Sankofa for you know organizing and producing that. Um, I watched that whole interview, and that was an important resource as well when I was writing for this. Oh, but here are the nicknames. <laughs> Christine, I don't know if you can hear, but everybody is commenting on people that I knew. So I think this is this is a big hit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, the nicknames were a really special um, yeah. part of this exhibit. <laughs> Christine, when you, I know you had a couple of requests to look at other buildings, but I'm going to see if anybody has a question or comment while you're pulling that up. Anybody have? Oh, oh, you had some. Hi, Christine. Thank you so much. And I want to take a look on the Enid Hall's heading. Oh. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. In the exhibit. 
So here's her section and here's a photo of Enid Hall. And Christine, if you can go to building 1012, somebody online has asked to see 1012. Okay. Give me just a moment to search around. Sometimes it can be a little difficult to find because there's so many buildings. Ah, here it is. So here's building 1012. Uh, these were the families that Enid had listed. It looks like we haven't uh, programmed in any portrait photos yet onto this building, but we do have the census data. Yeah, as Christine was saying, we're still adding content in here and that's why this is not live yet because we're, we've still got a lot of photos that we can add in. No, this project, yeah, I agree, project might not end. <laughs> Here's another comment. May I say one other thing? When they opened up the, uh video, you all will see P-U-C-K mark on there. In La Boca, hardly anyone went by their names. They were all nicknames. Mm. And that was my name. And one of the problems that I had, I know when I came in the service, because even if you look at my uh, transcript at school, you wouldn't find my name in there hardly. Everyone knew me as Pux or Fox. <laughs> and if you see people today that come from La Boca that hadn't seen me in a while, that's what they're going to call me. And when I came in the service, soon after I got in, about three or four days, they went to pay us some money. And I wrote P-U-X down on the paper. And the first time I heard a man curse the way he did. <laughs> and he threw the payroll and the money, it went flying because I put P-U-X Warner on, the, on, on his payroll. And that meant that the line behind me, no one else could get paid. He had to turn it in. And we had to wait 10 days before they made another payroll to give it to you. It cost me from five o'clock to nine o'clock writing my name down 500 times on a sheet of paper locked up in a room. <laughs> locked up in a room. I was locked up in a room there at Fort Amador. I don't know if any of you uh, remember Fort Amador. But that they locked me up in there. And the reason is every time I wrote my name, I started writing my name the way he told me, me my name was, or what my name was, as Everett. And I went E-V-R-O-D. But then right after that, I put P-U-X. <laughs> and they tore the sheet up. And one time I know I was almost completed with the 500 times writing it. And it was completely torn up. I had to start all over. <laughs> never, never in my life have I heard my mother or father call me Everett. They've always called me Fox. Same with my brother. Thank you so much. And Christine, we had another building request. Was it 1057? Yes. 1057 on Trinidad. Here it is. I'll repeat that. Okay, so here's 1057 uh, with the names that Enid listed out. Um, and they sent, 
and the census pages connected to that building. I mean, we don't, we don't have photos for this one yet, but that's not to say we wouldn't add something if we had any of the families or names there that we could cross-reference with yearbooks, for example. Uh, other questions or comments for Christine about her project? Oh, we got another building request, 979. Sometimes it works in your favor and they're all right in a row. And then other times you're hunting and- Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There we go. So that's a five family residence with Mandeville, Woodruff, O'Keefe, Ely, Lewis, Yancey, Gill, and Barnett. There you go, Barnett. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, we have a, a one message here. Uh, this is a, a happy birthday a shout out to Mr. Earl Holder. Uh, happy 99th birthday. Uh, yeah, round of applause. Uh, so Earl is a uh, retired Panama Canal pilot and son of Barbadian parents who immigrated to Panama. Uh, he is also one of the interviewees featured in uh, the video segment of the Gamboa website, uh, and uh, we thought a birthday order, a birthday salute would be in order. So uh, congratulations to him. He actually, it's a great interview. That all of those Gamboa, the, the Gamboa reunion group. I talked about them yesterday, but uh, they're on our website now, and they're going to be in some of the links that we send out. But the interviews they did, I, I just love uh, those interviews we've been using for several years. Um, Let's see, other questions or comments? Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm Joni Arlene Enid's third born. And first of all, I want to thank Sankofa, thank the University of Florida for this, because I can remember sitting sometimes with my mom and watching her do her little squibbling, which to me was just a hobby. And to see it turn into something like this. And I specifically, I can say yesterday, Marva went up to the notebook and she came back here and said, oh, I looked at my house number and I found my family. And then I looked at this other list and found my father where he worked. And I was, that just put me in awe then. And of course, all of this today is just amazing. So. I give thanks for whatever vision gave it to my mom to do this. Cause like I said, for me, it was just a little hobby that I saw her doing. I remember her doing some of the nicknames and um, it's, it's really great. And for others to have this and be able to, you know find their own families and see information about it. So thank you guys so much for this. Thank you. And thank you the family for trusting us with your family treasures. Uh, Let's see, I have another question I'm gonna to go to over here on chat and then I'll come back around. I know we have another building request too to look and see what we have on it. Uh, I'm gonna read this from chat. So, uh, and Christine, you can go ahead and go to building 353 while I'm asking this question to the audience. So this is actually a question for the, for the group. Uh, does anyone in the room or online know or remember when Fort Amador and the, uh, H the headquarters buildings of the 15th Naval District US bases uh, were built near Laboca. Oh, here we go. Here's our resident expert. <laughs> and, and he served, so he should know. The headquarters for the military down in uh, the canal zone was at Fort Amador. However, the naval was across the canal uh, at Coco Solo. And I don't know if any of you remember Coco Solo, but uh, Coco Solo was where the Naval Headquarters itself was. That shortly after you passed the entrance to uh, Fort Kobe, uh, going on into the what we used to call the interior. 
but the headquarters itself, and you found most of the Navy officers there, the high rankers were also there at Fort Amador. And can you say your name one more time? My <laughs> I'm going to say something. He just not embarrassed me, but he also caused me to get a hurt in my heart. And I said, <laughs> no, no, I, I'm going to say my real name. However, for the ladies in the house, I'm, I'm being truthful. For the ladies in the house, I'm going to pronounce my name Evrod. Everard, E V R O D. And I started pronouncing my name that way because the women, when I pronounced it the proper way, they thought I was being rude. And so, because of that, I came into this of Everard. But if, and well, all of you here know in Spanish, E V is Eve. My right name is Everod. Everod is my right name. But I don't say Everod because the women think I'm being rude when I say that. <laughs> so I say Everod. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> the uh, building request was for 1053, and Christine pulled that up. Uh, so she's showing that on the screen. And we have another question or comment over here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. Chris Busey, I'm a professor here at the University of Florida. Um, I've had the honor and privilege of meeting several of you over the past day or so. And um, in meeting several of you, I've expressed that I've been working on a book for the past two years documenting Black educational histories across the African diaspora and the Americas, focusing partly on uh, Black education in the Panama Canal Zone. Um, before I left here today, um, I just wanted to express to you all how being in this space has been so reinvigorating. Um, I've always taken seriously the work that I do because of where I come from. Um, and listening to the laughter, listening to the comments, the stories, um, I'm just reminded so much of my family who has lost a lot of our history. And I don't think sometimes as academics in the space, we really understand the importance of this work that we're doing. This is bigger than an exhibit. This is bigger than a collection. This is preserving black history, preserving histories that otherwise the state would want us to erase. I've lost five family members. My grandfather was one of 24. My grandmother was one of 17. There's one more left on my grandfather's side. There are three more left on my grand, uh, one more left on my grandfather's side, three more left on my grandmother's side. We've lost five over the past two years, all due to COVID. And I just tell people, I tell my students, I tell my daughters just how important those losses are because we lost these stories. We lost the documents, we lost the narratives and I'm trying to do whatever I can to maintain it and preserve it. And again, I just wanted to say how reinvigorating it is to hear your laughter to hear the stories because it's motivated me even more to be so responsible, not just to the stories that I'm trying to tell with the book, but to my own family history. So thank you all for that over the past day, so. Thanks, Chris. Other questions or comments for Christine? Yeah. Go. Can, can Chris, <laughs> can christine cross section by search by name 
and the building pull up. Uh, let me, Christine, do you want to answer that or do you want me to take a stab at answering that? You can certainly go first if you like. Um, if I, if I think I'm understanding the question correctly, you're asking if there's like a way to like search for a name and then find what building number is connected to that name? That's, that's correct. That's the question. Yeah. Okay, John, I don't know if this is how you were going to answer it, but we do have a spreadsheet right. um, that we made of Enid's notebook uh, with all of that data, but that spreadsheet is not currently uh, publicly available anywhere yet, um, but it is it is possible on our end at the moment, but not yet for the public. Well, that's exactly right, Christine. And what we'd like to do, uh, Christine said this earlier in the presentation, but I, I can expand on this a little bit. Uh, everything that we're doing with this that we have the ability to put online, we're going to put online, including our own spreadsheets that we've created and the data we've pulled together. Uh, so Christine, actually, her spreadsheets got pretty complicated where she was cross-referencing yearbooks. And, and we're just going to put all of that online. It won't be in this slick interface here that Christine has put together for the exhibits purposes, but it'll all be available and you can go into that spreadsheet and you can just search for a name and then hit the building number. Keep in mind that, you know, all of this, there's an error of, you know, fallacy and, and, and some of this is memory, some of it is census records, which, you know, even census records have errors in them. And so we're pulling together data from a lot of sources and it's not going to be a 100% thing, but it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> Christine, she, she said it's awesome. So I think you got a good rave review there. Thank you. Under Thank you very much. Questions or comments? Yes. Just one sec. Just have a question from one of my relatives that's watching on Zoom, wanting to know how soon will this go live for them to be able to see it? That's a great question. We, we were pretty vague in saying uh, in a few months because we, uh, it, we weren't kidding earlier when we said this is probably one of those projects that you can continually add on to. Um, my goal is, and Betsy and I have been talking about this, we'd like to get it on by the end of the year. Uh, so shooting for December. Um, we'll see if that happens. Um, we are going to um, send everybody information when this goes live. So if you participated, you're, you're going to know, and certainly we're going to reach out to the family members and let you know that this is going live. Um, if there's any significant delay, we'll also let you know that. We're not going to leave you out there hanging. It's pretty close, though. I mean, Christine really did knock it out of the park for us. Yeah. Um, to maybe motivate you, December 31st is Enid's birthday. So. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, any other a... questions or comments? All right. Seeing none. Christine, thanks again. You did an amazing job. Um, thank you, John, so much for, you know, assisting with the questions and stuff. And thank you again for everyone uh, attending um, and listening and watching my presentation. Uh, like I said before, I feel so grateful to be given this opportunity to present this and share this with you all. And it, it's so close to being done, um, but it just needs a little bit more work. It's not quite there yet, but I'm so excited for... Uh, when it'll eventually go live and be officially published for everyone to be able to explore it and read all the history and everything. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. All right, and Christine, if you wanna go ahead and mute and I'll start sharing my screen. Let's see here. And I think what I'm gonna, for those of you in the room, I'm gonna give you a little bit of heads up. I'm gonna walk over and turn the lights on in a second. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to get blinded. All right. So we are officially uh, at the end of our two-day program. That was our last uh, session. <laughs> I see some sunglasses in the room. I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, we're going to... Uh, close out now with, uh, let's see, I'm going to invite Kasma up here in a moment to say a few words. Uh, and while she's making her way to the podium, we're still recording, yes. Um, while Kasma is making her way to the podium, I wanted to, again, thank um, 
support we've had from the University of the, the Smathers Libraries, from the Center for Latin American Studies, and of course from our terrific partners at Pan Caribbean Sankofa. This doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what I think of, wow. We spent two days, it's only been two days, but I'm full. I just want to say again, thanks to those who contributed to this conference, there are so many, but I'm gonna make an attempt at this. To Nydia Thomas and family, Dr. Leah, Dr. Leah Rosenberg and all her students, and I know it took a lot of work. Dr. Caroline Leifers and her uh, speaking to us of disabilities, Roman Foster, and his labor of love, the diggers. Thanks also to Christine Reynolds, the family of Enid Hall. Thanks for too many things to John Niemers and Betsy Bemis. Thanks to the University of Florida, Panama Canal Museum collection specifically. Thanks to our main, many supporters, including CGM, uh, SAMAP, and, and you know, that umbrella. And thanks to Carmela Gobern and the, the Cyber News. You might not know, but she did a lot of pushing this forth. Um, and thanks to you, our audience, whether you're in person, or online, we've spent two days soaking up information, memories, and new perspectives. We looked into the past to see what it must have looked like during the construction of one of the marvels of the world and how our forebears contributed to this historic event. Without recognition, many of our ancestors made the ultimate sacrifice. The canal was literally built on their backs, on the backs of those courageous men. We heard about the consequences of the dangerous labor necessary to build the canal and the price that they paid to get it done with little appreciation and less care for their welfare. Yet, we won't be bitter. We'll just get educated. We'll get educated and learn to appreciate what we have, what is ours. And we've turned out pretty great, I think. Our culture, our way of life, our communities, our success, those are things that we're learning more about and we're proud of those who preceded us. We thank the families who shared their stories with us. Our job has only just begun and we're excited to share what we learn with those coming and with all our friends who share in our joy of just discovery. I like one of the descriptions made of the Milton Garvey case study. It said, a collective story, not static, but an evolving, ongoing, living project. I feel privileged to have been involved in this particular conference. And I feel that I'm leaving enriched. I'm feeling full and hopeful. I thank you all for being here in person. I thank you for being online, for making the effort, and for those who will be listening to this recording later. Be well. Thank you.
forgot something. <laughs> Sorry. I'd like to introduce uh, once more Fran Williams Ewer. Carmen. And Carmen. <laughs> just first of all, I just want to say these are the faces of Pan Caribbean Sankofa right here. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank our family. Thank our friends. Thank our new friends for being here to support us, to encourage each and every one of us that we have a story to be told. And we can learn from each other's story. We can preserve and we can continue. And John and Betsy from 2019 July for us to be able to enrich ourselves, enrich our children, enrich our future generations, to leave a little piece of ourselves and our ancestors for them to enjoy. So on behalf of us, John and Betsy, come up, please. Let's see, we didn't have time to wrap it. <laughs> <laughs> and we want a little color in your house. <laughs> if you've been to Betsy's house, it's beautiful. Yeah. 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 These are the birds, the, the mola. Yeah. And we hope the bird represents Sankofa in some little way. He's looking back. Thank you. And we will get it. Uh, Frame for you. Okay. And um, um, I don't think, Betsy, that you have been on a canal tour. I Either you or John. I have. Yes. Oh, you have. have. Then okay, we're not giving you. That. <laughs> 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 so, um, uh, Betsy, uh, you and I have talked about doing a trip together. Mm -hmm. This one is Carmela's tour. They're weekly tours to transit in the canal. Carmela Cyber News, who is our great promoter and, and publicist for everything that we do. Um, she puts on, I think, three times a year. Her next tour is on November 12th. I'm trying to get Betsy, John, to give her the days off to go to Panama <laughs> with me. But in any event, if we don't make it on the 12th, you have an open invitation on behalf of Plan Caribbean and Copa to do a canal tour. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, and John, well, maybe we'll give you, you maybe get a different perspective on the second <laughs> <laughs> I, I will gladly go back. So here's your reminder, <laughs> Thank Fran. you so okay. much. Thank you. And um, that's great. As you, you've worked really hard, John, in the last <laughs> month, even, or months, three years, really. So we want to have a little token here for you to sip on as you think more about, you know, what you can do with the history of our people. <laughs> <laughs> Not next. So we got him a 15 year abuelo love. Grandfather edition for him to enjoy. This is I terrific. Know. I appreciate Thank it greatly. Thank, Thank you, John. And thank you all in virtual world for being with us over the last two days. I hope that you have learned as much as we have and have appreciated all the effort and love that has went gone into um, what we have been uh, preparing for and presenting to you. More to come and we look forward to you reaching out to us and sharing or wanting to share a piece of your family's history. Thank you. Oh, yes. In signing off for today, I just want to add, our ancestors do not want to be forgotten.
Be well and home soon. Thank you, Carmen. If the next time we get together and we unveil a project for you, if it's a little wonky and weird, it's because I was enjoying this a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say quickly, thank you again to everybody who joined us online. Uh, we're sorry you couldn't be here in person, but we are glad you were able to participate. Um, we've recorded everything and we're going to be sending out links after the fact. So if you missed anything, we're, we're, we're going to send you links so you can see the recordings. Um, please reach out to us if you have questions or comments. We, we love to engage with everybody. So please contact us. I also wanted to say one more thank you because it really does take a, a small army to put together the things we do here. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge Pam Cunningham. If you'll stand up, Pam, I'm gonna embarrass you. Pam Cunningham Williams, Lydia, who's our student assistant next to her. Melissa Jerome, if I can get her to stand up from chat, she's been monitoring chat for us. And there's many others I have not mentioned who have been helping us. Oh yes, I'll get that back to you. Uh, thank you so much. This has been truly uh, a wonderful event and it's, it's been so great to see and meet all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.